This episode of the Memory Palace is brought to you by Amazon Prime's exclusive Lore. It's a chilling six-episode anthology series from executive producer of The Walking Dead and an executive producer of The X-Files based on the podcast phenomenon with over 70 million downloads. Creator and narrator Aaron Mankey explores the most terrifying tales throughout history, takes a myth that is rooted in historical folklore, and twists it, exposing timeless terrors that still haunt us today. Real life can scare you to death. Watch exclusively on Amazon Prime Video this October, starting on Friday the 13th. This episode of Memory Palace is brought to you by our friends at Article, makers of fine furniture with fantastic industrial and mid-century and Scandinavian designs. Also the makers of The Lamp that is lighting this script as I read it. They have everything you need at Article for your home, including brand new, a whole array of fine leather couches. These are really beautiful, extraordinarily well-made, just like everything they've got. And for $49, they will ship anything, including a large, beautiful leather couch to your front door, regardless of size. And you can get $50 off your first order of $100 or more at article.com slash memory palace. That's article.com slash memory palace. This is the Memory Palace. I'm Nate DeMeo. Let's take a few minutes to remember the story of Joyce Heth, though there's so little we know of it, at least the parts that weren't made up. We'll start in Lower Manhattan in 1835 where there's a salesman working the front counter of a general store. He's 25 and bored, wishing he were doing something different, wishing he were living more, the usual. And then walks a man. Now, we don't know where this actually all went down, but to keep our story streamlined and dramatic, we'll just say it all happens right there in the store. So in walks a man named Corey Bartram, and he steps up to the counter and tells our bored young man that he's got a proposition for him, a business deal that will change the young man's life. And though neither man of course, knows it at that moment right there in the store. It will wind up changing the world. Bartram tells the young man that down in Philadelphia, there's a show that he's just got to see. And the guy who runs the show is looking to sell. He's looking for someone to take it over for like 3000 bucks. So, cut to Philadelphia. The two sit in the audience in a dingy little theater. And the show is pretty good. However, three grand is a lot of money in 1835, especially for a 25-year-old sales clerk with no experience at all in show business. But this is no ordinary sales clerk. He was born for this sort of thing. He's a natural. And he knows that there's incredible potential here, but he doesn't let on. He hems and haws about the price. He says he's just not sure, even though he's totally sure. And he talks the owner down to $1,000. Both men walk away feeling like he just got away with murder. Though from the twinkle we can see in the young man's eye, we know who's right about that. The young man is Phineas Taylor Barnum of Bethel, Connecticut. And his career as P.T. Barnum, world-famous showman, starts here with this $1,000. The show he bought that day was started by a man named R.W. Lindsay. Lindsay told the story about coming across an elderly slave who was living in an outhouse in a farm in Kentucky's Jefferson County. And he purchased the woman and then started inventing a different story. The woman's name was Joyce Heth. She was around 80 years old, though nobody could really know for sure, probably not even her. And certainly no one else cared about how old a slave was, unless, as Lindsay and later Barnum would claim, that slave happened to be 161 years old. This is the story that was concocted for Joyce Heth. 108 years earlier, when she was already 54 years old, she was bought by a Virginia farmer named Augustine Washington, who needed her to take care of his infant son, George Washington. And so when P.T. Barnum took over the show and brought Joyce Heth to Broadway, the people who lined up to buy tickets were not only paying to see a natural wonder of incredible age, of not at all credible age, they were also paying to see a living, breathing link to the much beloved and dearly departed father of their country. And Heth put on a good show. She looked the part. She was blind and partially paralyzed. Her owners hadn't cut her nails in years, so they curled and twisted, making her hands and feet look kind of like claws, the way a customer might suppose his own might look if he lived to be 161. And she acted the part. She told stories of bathing baby George, of seeing in her young charge flashes of brilliance and preternatural virtue that befit the great man he would later become. She was even there the day he chopped down the cherry tree, 
which was another story that was completely made up. Joyce Heth was a hit. Barnum was pulling in $1,500 a week in New York and later on tour. He could have made more money too, but he had to cut down the number of performances. It seemed Heth was easily exhausted, which was, he'd tell the press, to be expected from someone who was 161. But after a while, people started to doubt Barnum's story. 161 was really old, and ticket sales slumped. But Phineas Barnum, anonymous sales clerk, became P.T. Barnum, world-famous showman, for a reason. He came up with a new story. He started a rumor that the old story was a scam, that not only was Joyce Heth not a 160-year-old woman, she wasn't even a woman. She was a robot, a wind-up automaton made of leather and whalebone. And people bought tickets to see if that was true. And when Heth died in 1836, less than a year after Barnum had bought her and the story that came with her, he sold tickets to her autopsy and said there must be some sort of mistake when the doctor said she couldn't have been much more than 80. And thus ends the story of Joyce Heth. Barnum's, of course, continues. He goes on to fame and fortune. He changes the world. But that's it for her story. I wish there was more that I could tell you, but there isn't really. There are details I left out, of course, about which cities she visited on tour, about the hymns she sang during her performances, about the stories that she told of young George Washington. But not the things that I'd like to tell you, not the things that I'd like to know, because nobody wrote those things down. And probably no one ever bothered to ask. So I can't tell you how she actually came to be bought by R.W. Lindsay, or how he came up with the Washington story, or what she thought about that, or why she went along with it, or how it felt to be on display, or perform every night, or move from city to city at 80 years old, cities that she couldn't even see. I'd like to know what she and Barnum talked about in the idle hours between shows or in the backs of horse-drawn wagons between cities. I'd like to know what she did in the 80 years before she was taken from that Kentucky farm. I'd like to know what work she did, and for whom she did it, before she did that strange work from Barnum telling stories about working for Washington. I'd like to know whether she was born in this country, or whether she was taken here, and from where was she taken, and from whom. I'd like to know who she loved, and whose story she could have told instead of the ones that someone made up about someone she'd never known. But I can't. I can take a few minutes to remember the story of Joyce Heth, when I'd rather take a few minutes to remember her. <laughs>